The other thing is I try to attend uh, town halls or employee meetings when, when you can get an invite to it uh, that are held throughout the organization because that just gives you so much insight into the priorities of any given part of your org, what that leader is emphasizing. Uh, you just get a lot of great intel from going to those meetings. This episode is brought to you by Green Skies Analytics, an audit analytics service provider that works with internal audit departments that have data analysts and are still frustrated with trying to make analytics actually work, aren't getting the expected ROI, who can't break through the communication barrier between the analysts and the audit team, and those that need experienced direction for an audit analytics strategy and process. Those that feel like they've wasted time and money on trainings, aren't getting the value they want, not prioritizing the highest risk areas for the organizations, or have projects that seemingly never get completed. Do you deal with any of that? If you do, go to the show notes of this episode and click the Green Skies Analytics link or go to greenskiesanalytics.com to schedule a call and understand how Green Skies Analytics makes analytics actually work for internal audit. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Audit Podcast. I'm your host, Trent Russell. Today on the show, we have Katie Rich. She is the CAE at Williams. Williams, for those who don't know, handles about a third of the nation's natural gas. And what was super interesting about Katie is she has zero background in internal audit, yet here she is as a CAE. And so we wanted to understand how does someone with no audit background get into a CAE position so that we can understand what's important to folks in, uh, you know, in being a CAE and then develop those skills. So that's one route that we go down, as well as the thing that drew me to Katie is I saw she were, where she was on a couple of different boards. I think it's critically important and a huge advantage for internal auditors to sit on boards and understand their perception of things and how they view the world and the company um, so that we can work with them better and provide them what they need when they need it. And so we, we get practical advice is probably one of my favorite bits that we did was practical advice on how to get on a board. Once you're on a board, what do you do? How do you get acclimated? Uh, what do you need to know? How do you basically not be terrified? Because it can be kind of intimidating once you're there um, and how you can actually do that. Katie also mentions how when she was not in the audit role, she got audited. So I always think it's interesting to, to get the other the other perspective on that. What's it like to be on the other side? And Katie said that she actually had a really good experience with the internal audit team. And so we, we wanted to understand what was so great about it so that, again, us in audit can understand that, leverage it, and be better auditors, especially for uh, our clients or auditees or however you refer to them. And then the other thing was, and I'm trying not to give too much away, but basically the reason that Katie was able to go from no audit background to CAE at, at Williams was because she understood the business so well. We wanted to understand how can we better understand our business? How can we better understand our industry? We've asked that question before on the show. I think the advice Katie gives is very practical, easy to implement, and really valuable. And so that's uh, kind of towards the top. With that said, here we go. What is in your, either your internet browsing history or your chat gpt or any other llm that you might use but like what's been going on recently in your world so uh well work wise i've been you know trying to onboard new people into the department i've got a new rotation rotational employee starting next week and so most recently i asked copilot we use microsoft copilot here um how would you describe internal audit to a college student and so that that was interesting the, but the disappointing thing is the first time I asked it, I got a really great answer. I was like, oh, I need to capture that. And then I undocked my computer and ran to a meeting and I lost it. Like it reloaded the page and I lost it. So I had to ask it again. It had a it had a good example of, you know, internal auditors are a little bit like a doctor or a primary care physician doing a health check, you know, on you and checking your vitals, checking your, um, you know, are you taking your medications like you should? And, mm-hmm. and then making recommendations that the patient can, decide to follow or not but i thought that was pretty good okay anything on the the personal front yeah so personally uh probably bikereg.com and any website for a bike race that i've come coming up on so i race my bike in in uh, several different venues and uh so i'm always like checking on my did i register for the race who all is registered what's my competition you know where 
what time do we need to be there for a packet pickup? So. Probably an important one to know. Yeah, the timing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All uh, right. the schedule is support. So, yeah. All right, and I know that you're you don't have an audit background yet. Here you are leading the audit department at Williams, and um, I know in talking to you kind of offline, you'd said it was basically because you understood the business so well that they went, "Yep, all right, she can figure it out. She's smart and she knows the business really well, which is critically important for an auditor, uh, especially a CAE." And you mentioned the importance of that also. So, and it's a question that we've asked similarly before. But with that being like your thing that you're pretty diehard about, what can auditors do to better understand the business that they're in, the industry that they're in, and develop a better business acumen? Great question. Well, there's a couple of things that uh, when I came into the role, I started to encourage the team to do. Um, one is a really simple thing. Just call into your company's earnings call every quarter. Listen to what the CEO is saying, the CFO understand the big projects that they're highlighting, where they are um, seeing the company going, how they feel about the earnings results. Um, so so do that. You know, it's always something that you can just sign up for those meetings. The other thing is uh, try to attend uh, town halls or employee meetings when, when you can get an invite to it uh, that are held throughout the organization because that just gives you so much insight into the priorities of any given part of your org what that leader is emphasizing. Uh, you just get a lot of great intel from going to those meetings. Um, and then don't don't discount the informal interactions you can have. So we've got employee resource groups. I know a lot of companies do. You know, they have a lot of different activities that go on. And just going to those, having a presence, allows you to make connections with people, make new relationships. It's, it's crazy the things I've heard from employees in the company just by having those informal interactions and I'm like oh I didn't know you guys were working on that project or oh hey you know tell me how this is going what are you working on lately so it's just a, a great way to understand what's going on for, for the people that want to take on more or be more involved with these employee resource groups who should they reach out to to go hey when's the next thing how do I get signed up for it is that usually an HR initiative or how how can people uh, take the next step and in getting involved with that yeah so the, the employee resource groups are coordinated under our HR department, and then each resource group has an employee-led uh, leadership team that isn't HR people. So uh, they could contact their HR representative, say, hey, do we have these kind of resource groups? If so, you know, where can I find them? And those, are, you know, if people aren't familiar with it, it would be things like the Black Employee Resource Group or the Native American Employee Resource Group, um, LGBTQ. So, you know, there's just... And, and almost all of them are open to members of that group or allies. So, you know, you could join it. And, and then we have, you know, a Teams channel for each group and where you can see what's going on, get the invites. Um, but to start with HR, probably the best place to start. Okay. We got a CAE on who, as far as we could tell, is the youngest CAE of a publicly traded company in the U.S. ever. Uh, we didn't exactly, I know... Um, work with a third party to do research on that but we went yeah that's, that's probably about right uh you know based on our collective knowledge and so we went that way but anyway he kind of skyrocketed up um the hierarchy and got facetime with the ceo of a you know fortune 100 company that he was with at the time because he started one of these employee resource groups there there you know there's kind of a gap there um, and so he said, look, I'll start it and run it. And that gave him so much face time with the executives and a lot of other folks in the organization that it really, really, uh, benefited him and his career. So I would say if you don't have those pick one and start it up. Yeah. Great advice. Great advice. And you're absolutely right. A lot of the executives will come out to some of the events that these ERGs put on, and, you know, another way to, to have a connect with one of the executives too. So. Yeah, because that was one thing when I left public accounting and went into internal audit as an FTE that I missed was um, like I just didn't know as many people. So when I was in the external audit, I mean, I would see clients all over the place, you know, be on site. I could stop by and talk to him, whatever. And I kind of missed that. And so I asked my um, boss, I was like, is there a committee or something that I can get on so that I can see people? And when I'm walking the halls, be like, hey, what's up? Katie, Jill, J you know, Bob, whatever. Um, cause I didn't like, it, you know, sitting in the office and just doing my work and that being it. And so, um, 
I always try to encourage people also to jump on those committees where you can have like an audit presence if you know, uh, where you can. The yeah. earnings call though, I was curious, do you all collectively as a team, an audit team, do you listen to those together or is it one person goes, take notes, sends it back? Like how does that look? We've done it both ways. So if I'm on my game, I make sure we have an invite out to the team to remind them that, you know, cause it, it's funny, we don't get an invite to all employees that this is happening. You know, you have to kind of, if you're into the ground that it's scheduled. So I try to make sure there's an invite on their calendar and then and a link to it. And then we have tried sometimes to get in a conference room together. It helps us all stay focused, you know, and not start multitasking. Um, but they're a little bit early in the day. So uh, sometimes people just call from their desk, depending on the, the quarter. I mentioned earlier, you don't have an audit background. So I did want you to share what is your background and then how you became uh, a CAE despite not having an audit background. And one reason I wanted to hit on that is one, it's just interesting to hear people's backgrounds, but then two, for those that are looking to almost, I would say, gain some kind of advantage or become a better auditor, if you, Katie, had no audit background, yet you were so good at this one given thing that you became a CAE, then I think it makes sense for auditors to then go, hey, maybe I should focus a little bit more on that to, you know, if that's their ultimate goal is to do that. So uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So most of my career has been in GIS, uh, which is Ge Geographic Information Systems. And um, I have an anthropology degree too, and did some work in social services, but most of my time in, in the oil and gas field has been in GIS. And uh, really thought I'd stay there forever, but you know, got to a point where I really liked Williams and working for Williams, and I wanted to do something different and have a, a new challenge. So when this role came open, my uh, boss at the time came to me and said, hey, I think you should consider applying for this. You'd be a good fit. And initially I didn't see the fit. You know, I'm not an accountant, I'm not an auditor. Not sure, um, but I recall that I had had an experience where GIS was audited by this group, the system, it was an IT audit. And I remember that was a really great experience with that auditor because he gave us good insights. He helped us understand what was really going on. And then we used the findings from that audit to um, contribute to justification for a big project that we wanted to do to improve the system. So, you know, I, I was like, well, that was great, you know, so this, there's goodness in that group. Let, let me check it out. And I had a, a conversation with the current CAE at the time. And she started talking about data analytics, um, agile project management, you know, all these things that I had familiarity with from the GIS work, which is on the business side, but very technical, works a lot with IT. So we had, we had been exposed to some of these concepts and ideas. Um, and I thought, well, this makes a lot of sense. You know, I am a fit for that kind of work. And if they're okay with me learning the other parts of the business, I could learn what I need to learn. And um, so went ahead and applied and, and was thankfully selected for it. But I think the analytics piece was key. You know, they, there was really a lot of drive to bring more analytics into what internal audit was doing. And, um, you know, with my previous role, GIS isn't something that everybody knows about, but if you're company has location as an important aspect of their business, then GIS has a role. And within GIS, we worked with almost the whole company. So it was a support, support group that interacted across the board. So we learned the business through that work over, over time. And um, so I had a lot of familiarity with people. I had a, I had a lot of co connections across the organization. I knew a lot of people. I also knew data sets. So I've been able to point the team to some data sets maybe they didn't know about or didn't know how to navigate because of that experience with GIS had integrations with like 10 different systems in the company. So, you know, had really built up some knowledge around all that. We've started to see a little bit of a shift. I don't, again, no research done on this, pretty anecdotal, but historically it's always been, you know, if you aren't a, a CPA, then you're not going to be a CAE, especially for mainly financial services. It's a, you know, pretty pretty important to be a CPA, but we've started sure. to see a little bit of a trend where it's like, no, we want the IT person or the IT background, the analytics background, uh, potentially maybe even the AI background as that kind of evolves to take on the CAE role. So I do think that is important. It seems like it's finally, I know you're relatively new to audit, but yeah. since I can remember, we've been talking about that, you know, analytics and audit's been around for 35 plus years and there's always been like a push, but it hasn't taken off for some folks the way um, maybe it was advertised. And so it is interesting, I think now to see the shift in, yep, people with more heavier 
tech backgrounds as opposed to um, accounting or CPA backgrounds are starting to get elevated to CAE roles. So um, I think that's fantastic, especially as an analytics person myself. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, though, that you underwent an audit when you were in the GIS group and that it was a good experience. So yeah. you being on the audit T side of things, what made it great? So i.e., what can listeners take away from your experience and go, okay, that's what we should kind of strive to do. That's what they actually want. So what made it great for you? What I loved was the auditor was really receptive to feedback around, hey, like, can you talk to these additional people to get, you know, a bit of maybe a more well-rounded picture of what you're looking at. Uh, I really liked that. The auditor, his demeanor was very approachable, very, um, it made you feel comfortable, didn't, didn't feel like the inquisition or coming in and, and going after the group. Uh, so that was, that was excellent. And, uh, he actually was still in the group when I took the role too. So that was fun, fun circle. He's moved on now, but, uh, it was, uh, good in that way. And then, uh, I liked the detail in the report. We've actually gone away from having that much detail and we're, we've skinny down our reports quite a lot, which is, a struggle for me personally because I like to have as much detail like how did you pick your sample how big was your sample all that stuff and we don't really put any of that detail in anymore because no one most people don't care that much they just you know they just know want to know that you found something that they need to take action on but uh but I liked the the detail that he provided in the report um for me personally was was good so maybe a takeaway there being uh write your audit reports or communicate rather your audit uh, results in the manner that the client auditee, however we want to refer to it, prefers, right? Like you wanted a ton of detail. If it was me, I'd be like, give me like the two sentence thing. And then what do I need to do uh, after that? Cool. That's great. We'll see you guys, you know, when we see you, but you, you want the detail. So even maybe during the kickoff, you know, meeting or call or whatever that looks like for the audit, understanding what their communication uh, preferences and trying to uh, work with that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. Okay. And, and, and like today, if I were an auditee of this group, I would be open to, hey, you don't need to put all that in the report, but you know, if you just want to debrief me a little bit on some more detail, if you're willing to do that outside the meeting, and I know we would be, you know, we're always willing to have the extra discussions. Yeah, and my guess is you'd probably get more from that than like the report itself in terms of the relationship building from the auditor to the client. I'm going to call it client uh, rather than auditee. Um, but just so everybody's on the same page. So from auditor to client, I feel like having that pretty laid back conversation, you know, where they're, you're, it seems like in this case, you're just kind of almost wanting to pick their brains. How'd you pick the sample? What is a sample? What is the population? And understanding that, um, I feel like that could really benefit a lot of folks in terms of longer term relationship building as opposed to just like, all right, here is your two sentence thing, Trent, that you wanted. We'll see you later. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think just showing that you're responding to the voice of the customer and what the customer is needing and meeting them where they're at, you know, um, especially if this agile process is new for a lot of people, even in our organization, we've been a couple of years down the road on it now, but even right now we're doing an audit where most of the peep clients are new to this method and it's a little uncomfortable because it's fast. You know, we, we send out a draft, a draft snapshot and we're going to discuss it, but they haven't really had like days to pre-read it and provide feedback. So just helping people recognize that it's new for them and they're learning, they're getting comfortable with this. So if we need to do a little bit more to make them comfortable, I think that's, it goes a long way to having success in the long run. Probably no surprise to listeners that oftentimes the guest has something significantly better than the, the way that I butcher it. And so when you said responding to the voice of the customer, I think that's a really good way to kind of summarize it, um, the point that you're making. So uh, very well said. But what about your, so I'm interested in your GIS background and how, uh, I know you spoke to it a little bit already, but what the impact that's made on the audit team. How is that working? So I've been able to, introduce them to, to some tools and data sets they weren't weren't aware of uh, previous to me joining. So we've got some great web maps in the company that show where our assets are located. I mean, we're an operating oil and gas company, so we've got pipelines in the ground. We've got 
facilities and our teams do operational audits. So they're going out to the field once per ops audit. And uh, so now they know where to go and look, see like to check out the aerial imagery, get a lay of the land of what the facility looks like they're going to. Um, we've got some data sets that um, one of our auditors just recently used to understand kind of the hierarchy of the organization and, and which facilities are fitting under which part of the organization. So, and then I was, uh, I took a picture actually uh, uh, about a month ago, I walked past one of the offices and three of our auditors are standing there looking pensively at a map on the wall. <laughs> and uh, I was like, I've got to take a picture of you guys. This is awesome. You know? And they were, they were like eyeing up the G the map, the GIS had printed off for them. And like trying to figure out, understand that operating area, how is it laid out? What's the structure? So I thought that was perfect, you know, to see them really using that tool. Off camera, we talked about the importance of being just a well-rounded human being and generally interesting and the importance of that and especially developing relationships and rapport with, um, with clients. And I don't think anyone would disagree with that, but... I feel like people would go, yeah, that's great. How do you do that? You know, like that's not a super easy skill to develop. You don't just like read a book and be like, interesting. I am now interesting. Although I do have, uh, I remember reading a, a blog or book or something about this is how you can be more interesting. So I'll share that. But I'm curious, what can people do to develop those skills? What have you seen? What works for you? Yeah. Well, first, don't don't just work all the time. Like don't sacrifice yourself for work. And don't, don't give up your hobbies that you love, the things that enrich you outside of work because you're working all the time. You know, I mean, obviously we have work jobs to do. We've got to work hard, get our work done, but you have to, you have to make sure that you're doing the things that make you a whole, a whole energized, interesting person, because it's going to go a long way for yourself and your wellness, but also I think make you more successful. Uh, I've read, I've read things recently about how important it is to have that downtime how much more effective you are at work when you've done the things outside of work that give you energy. Um, and I heard, uh, I meant to look it up before this call and I forgot, but I heard a leader say, you know, work-life balance is fine. It's, it's important, but you can't always achieve that. Sometimes you work more, so you, you can't work as much as you'd like, but, but you need to have balance in the energy that you get from what you do at work and what you do at home. So, if everything you do at work drains your energy, you're not going to be very effective at home with your family. And if if you don't do anything on your downtime to give you energy, then you come to work and you're not a happy person and you're drained and you don't have energy. So like balance how you get your energy more than how much time you're spending in, in one given pursuit. So, so yeah, long story short, um, prioritize the time spent doing things that are interesting to you and then those will be interesting to somebody else it may not be the same you know the same thing that interests other people but i found that the easiest way to start a conversation with an executive or a board member is to talk about where did you go on vacation hey i just went to you know to this interesting place or you know i'm doing a bike race this weekend you know and and uh my discussions with the cfo half the time devol divulge into uh or dissolve into discussions of bike riding and motorcycle riding so you know but we build up that rapport and that comfort level through those those discussions yeah i like that um the the fact you said sub someone's going to be interested in the thing that you're interested in to some degree i think that makes a lot of sense um especially in i feel like now more than ever because every it seems like every little narrow niche hobby has a huge community online somewhere um, that you can find stuff that, you know, like underwater basket weaving that, you know, there's like thousands of people and they like are die hard about it. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, there probably is a, a community for everybody somewhere. And, um, I, th I think people are aware of that. The, the one thing that I, the tip, I guess that I took away from some thought leader, we're terrible with attributions on this show. And so don't you worry at all <laughs> about the, you're I like, I forgot remember. where I read that. I forget where I read stuff constantly. Um, yeah. I forget the names of books, authors don't stand a chance. I screw those up all the time. Okay. Um, so attribution is something we should probably work on being better at over here. But either way, the uh, the tip was basically to be more interesting, just ask questions. And I read that and I thought about there was a guy that I started with. We both started 
uh, at the same firm at the same time. We did our 101 train, 101, 102 IT audits training stuff together. Um, and I always thought like he was the most interesting person and never could really tap it. You know, I didn't do any deep research to understand why, but when I read that, I went, you know what? That guy asks everybody, no matter who it is, just like, I mean, great eye contact, like leans in, asks questions because he seemed generally interested in whatever the topic, you know, oh, you're into moss gardening. Tell me all about moss gardening. Like how much water do you need? How much sunshine do you need? Is it different in this area than it is in di- the you know, area? It's like, who cares? It's moss gardening, man. Do you really care that much? But he seemed to generally be interested in that. And so the kind of the takeaway was if you want to be interesting, be interested in other people's interests by asking them questions about it. And I thought, yeah, that's a really good, I think that's a really good tactical way um, to do that. It's just, it can require discipline if you really do not care about what that person's into. But either way, I thought that was a really good takeaway. Yeah, I love that. And I'm, when you, as you were saying that, I could think of people in my life that have been that way. And yeah, you just want to, you just want to spend more time with yeah. them. That you, you appreciate that they're really showing an interest in what you care about. Yeah, I know the 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 friend. Um, so you were picturing them too, yours, and I was picturing the person. Every time I see her, she's just you know, how's the podcast? And she is she's not in our world at all, but she always asks about it every single time. And like, who's the you know like who is the latest guest you had, or like who do you have coming up? And I'm like, do you really care? I don't know if you do, but I appreciate you asking. And I had to apologize to her one time. I was like. Um, I appreciate how much you ask questions and seem generally interested. And I apologize for not doing the same. Like it made me feel bad that I didn't reciprocate in some kind of manner. So, all right. Um, the other thing, and this was one of the big reasons I wanted to have you on and I forgot how I came across it. I'm sure it was on LinkedIn, but I noticed you were on a couple of different boards. And I know from my experience, uh, serving on a board, um, chairing an audit and finance committee, that's where I really got to see like at the executive type level, what they care about. And I started, you know, and hear their discussions, you know, what the, what they talk about. And I would think, okay, I remember getting or seeing this audit report where someone, you know, changed, you know, it was like, Hey, we recommend you change the name of this thing to this thing or, you know, what it was something so minor and insignificant. And I thought if this group of people saw that as a finding and they're spending their time reading that, how probably pissed they would be and definitely like, okay, audit clearly is still just missing the mark. Like we do not care about this. Bring us the stuff we need to know about. And so for me, I've always tried to recommend to people, if you can get on a board at any level, junior board um, uh, or otherwise, anything you can do to get that perspective, I think it's really great. So anyway, I noticed you were on a couple of boards and I wanted to see uh, if what advice you would give to others to also get on a board somewhere and gain that experience. Yeah, I, it's been fantastic. And I, the two boards I'm on are nonprofit boards, which I think is a great place to start because it's, they're usually happy to have people willing to help and work. And, um, right. you know, they have expectations, but it's a little bit easier entry than a, a for-profit board. So first of all, if you, I would find it an organization that you're passionate about because you can tell quickly if someone doesn't really care at all about the, the mission you know, you're, they're not going to be energized. They're not going to do their give their all. Um, and then start by volunteering just in any capacity. And that's how I got on the first board that I'm on is I I was just genuinely interested in this uh, alternative school here in Tulsa. And so I just started becoming a mentor and meeting with a student weekly and being their mentor. And after doing a, a couple rounds of mentoring, I was invited to be on the board. And, you know, so that's a great place just to be become um, familiar to the management and um, you know show your interest in in that um, that organization the other thing would be to engage with if your company has like a community outreach function or cor- corporate communications they might know of organizations that are looking for board members um, I know it's not uncommon that organizations will reach out to a company and say hey we're looking for another board member do you have anyone that would be a good fit so make your interest known to that group and they can help try to match you with an organization that makes sense and is it fits your interests what advice would you give once someone's on a board because i was super intimidated um 
when I got asked to do it, I was like, yeah, I'll do it because it sounds great. And then I remember thinking, do I, how, how do I even do this? Like I barely, know. fortunately I had this show. And so I, I grabbed someone who literally wrote the book on how to be a, you know, a finance chair for a nonprofit and I went, Hey, uh, can I pick your brain? And so I had the benefit of that, but what, what would you recommend? Cause it is, it can be, uh, pretty intimidating to walk in and be like, I am on the board now. What, the hell am I supposed to do? So what advice would you give for those that they're that like, yeah, I want to do it, but it's, it's scary. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, if the organization doesn't have a board orientation, I would ask for one or, you know, say, Hey, have you guys ever done a board orientation or ask one? So the, of the two boards I'm on one, um, they both do a pretty great orientation. One of them does it like for every new board member. And there's like a Two, over two days, a couple hours over lunchtime, they they go through everything, the history of the organization, the role, at, you know, all the committees. So I would ask for the orientation. If they don't have one, then I would probably ask for who has been on the board for, for a few years and could just kind of help mentor me a little bit, talk to me about what's expected. And it could be, you know, ideally someone who's been on the board probably three plus years if, if possible, because they'll, they'll have seen every, you know, everything that you might experience as a board member. And yeah, just don't be afraid to kind of ask for that mentor or that orientation because otherwise it is, it's hard to know. And every board is, operates a little differently. So, you know, even coming, coming into another organization with board experience, I, I learned new things. I experienced a different type of approach and, you know, it was good to have the orientation to get me set up for success there. Okay. Yeah. I tapped into the previous chair when I got like elevated to that position is where I really started to get a little nervous, you know, and yeah. I was like, what's the one thing that I need to make sure like every month and every quarter I need to do X, Y, Z, like what's the one thing? And he said, just do this. And I went, cool, I can do that. And similarly, yeah. I asked the, um, the, the expert uh, that I mentioned earlier, I was like, what's the one thing I need to do? And she's like, just make sure you know the metrics and you have those prepared in some manner. And I was like, sweet, I'm in analytics. Like I can knock this out in a day. Um, yeah. and so she's like, if you just do that and hold everybody accountable to those, you'll be good to go. Um, but then I also talked to a few CAEs that I knew were on boards and I asked them, you know, what advice would you give? And they were really helpful uh, in doing that also. So 100%, it, it, it's likely, um, your CAE is on a board or if nothing else, ask your CAE, if you can chat with the, you know, the, the AC chair and be like, what am I supposed to do now? So I'd very much right. tap into the network. There's a lot of experience out there, especially within, the uh, internal audit community, like there's a lot of folks that sit on boards. Um, maybe they're not a first connection, but certainly second connections for a lot of people that you can tap into. Yeah. The other thing I would say is when you do get on a board, you know, try to try to be very observant and try to figure out what the culture is early, you know, because again, it's a different group of people. The, you know, each organization operates differently. And so it helps to just observe and kind of, figure out okay who what are the relationships who are the people that are kind of driving things um and and how do they like to handle communications you know how do you bring up a concern what's the right channel to do that to be it's a little political and, and sometimes and so trying to figure out what the politics are early will just help you not stumble or get frustrated because you feel like you're not being heard maybe you're not quite following the right channels that that you need to I was waiting for you to say the word politics. That was something that, you know, because it was nonprofit. And I thought, oh, that probably doesn't really happen a lot around here. And then, yeah, eventually you kind of catch on. You're like, yep, it's pretty much the same everywhere, isn't it? Everywhere. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I've loved it. It's been great. I mean, I don't know for sure whether that was, you know, an aspect of my resume that was appealing for this role, but I like to think it was. You know, I certainly highlighted that experience on my resume, but it does, has definitely helped me in a smaller, less, less stressful setting to understand the difference between governance and management and where that line is. And sometimes it's a little gray because, and you see that then in the corporate setting too, it's not always very clear what falls squarely in governance and, and in management. And um, so it's just interesting. I see those themes surface in both settings. Yeah. Especially smaller boards, organization, not for profit where you do, even on the board, you take on a little bit of management, maybe do a little right. bit more than you probably would otherwise on a, a for-profit board. So yeah. All right. I think that's solid advice. So I know you have, again, the, the GIS background and the tech background, but maybe even outside of analytics, maybe, um, what are you doing with tech within your audit department and how has it 
what impact has it made? Efficiencies, effectiveness, like what, what's been the change that you've seen introducing maybe new latest and greatest tech or, or even old tech, but you're using it differently or how are you using tech in your audit department? So I think we've made some really good strides. You know, even my predecessor was moving in this direction and then I've really tried to put an emphasis on using technology to our benefit. And, you know, one of the key things is they've had a system of record for, you know, audit, audit system of record for a number of years. And it's, it's very effective. It works well for us. But what, what I have found is we need to keep going back to the source of truth and where and, and making our, improving our data to be authoritative. And so even for me trying to understand, okay, where are we at with our audit plan? How's the progress going? What are, how, how many findings are we having? Some of those basic KPIs that I need to be monitoring, we weren't able to do fully when I first came into the group because the data wasn't being maintained in the system of record to the degree that you need to, to produce those metrics. So we've really been going back to, okay, let's not try to rework the data outside the system. Let's improve the system and make it better so that the data coming out of it is reliable and we don't have to like iterate through spreadsheets, you know, to mm-hmm. get the information we need. So that's been exciting. And we have a business analyst really focused on those improvement efforts, um, which is another shift we made is like, she, it was her passion. She was doing some audit work, but really her passion was this business analyst work. And we were able to carve out that role for her. Uh, the other thing is we're, we're really trying to leverage the Microsoft suite and make it talk to each other. So we've got like Viva goals, Microsoft project teams, Azure DevOps, you know, they're all talking now, which is really exciting so that, uh, you know, pe- teams can manage their tasks in DevOps and it feeds Viva goals directly. That That's a newer product, I think, from Microsoft, it, one that we're just now adopting at Williams. But, you know, just trying to find those ways to make systems talk to each other so the auditors don't have to double enter information. We're not quite there yet with all of the tools, but that's, you know, where we're moving towards. So you're not copying, pasting the objective 15 different places. Yeah. Yeah. Drove exactly. me nuts. God, that drove me nuts. And I was like, even before some of the, the tools probably that you're using now uh, would do that. I was like, we could just like write a bot that would do this. We don't have to do this every time. Or even we don't even need to put that there. Can we just stop doing that? Bug me so much to have to deal with that. So it's good to know that we have folks like you leading yeah. the charge so that we no longer have to copy and paste multiple times, uh, even unnecessarily. Right. So, like I said, we still have a ways to go, but that's always the goal. Got to limit waste. Okay. Well, as we start to wrap up the show, uh, I'm going to give the floor to you. Anything else you want to leave the audience with? (laughs) So, the the last thing is something I've I've been passionate about for a number of years and uh, just actually talked to my team about in our department meeting today. We've got a campaign going on at work right now called See You Tomorrow, and it's about suicide prevention and awareness. And... You know, the idea that uh, you can have an impact and make a, an intervention in someone's life. And, and as coworkers, we see each other more than our family see us in a lot of times. And so we're the people maybe most equipped to notice if someone's a little bit off, if they're not quite themselves. And so what I'd leave the audience with is just be aware of the 988 number. Um, it's crisis and suicide prevention a helpline you can call 24 hours a day if you have a mental health crisis or someone you know does um call that number get them the help they need because you know we all have we have support available to us and sometimes life our where our jobs get real heavy uh our our family lives get heavy and we have crises and you know you don't have to go through it alone so rely on those resources and keep that number in mind Hey, everyone. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Audit Podcast. Whatever platform you're listening on right now, I'm sure there's a subscribe button somewhere. So please hit the subscribe button there. If you're listening through iTunes or Spotify, feel free to go give us that five-star rating. It only took me about 16 seconds to give myself a five-star review. And it really helps to get future guests to come on the show. So we'd really appreciate that. Lastly, be sure to check out the show notes and follow us on all our social media channels on Instagram, on LinkedIn, and on TikTok. Also, if interested, please sign up for our weekly newsletter from The Audit Podcast. Thank you all. Have a great one.